does it work now? Yeah. I think so. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome you all. I hope you had a chance to um, meet and greet the candidates in the front hallway this, this evening. Give you a good opportunity to put a face with a name and to get to know their views on the Board of Education and the Clerk of the Courts. Um, first of all, what I'd like to do is invite you all to stand and um, pledge allegiance. That sounds better. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, just and justice for all. Thank you. So this is a forum for the Republican candidates for county commissioner. So when you vote, you can vote for up to five candidates, one for commissioner at large and one from each district. This forum is being filmed and being recorded by Queen Anne's County TV. And I'd like to thank you, Jeff, for being here tonight and, um, and doing this recording. Um, this is presented by the League of Women Voters of Queen Anne's County, and I am Barbara Sharkey, and I'm the current president of our local league. You probably all know, but the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, and we, our goal is to have informed citizens who are going to the polls. So we do voter registration and we do these forums and we also do something called the voter's guide which probably a lot of you are familiar with but they're fresh off the press. They're going to be distributed in the papers. Um, they'll be in the Star Democrat on Sunday and the Record Observer on Friday. They're inserts. There also will be copies in the libraries and various other places around town. But there is a, a small stack of them here. If you, haven't, if you don't subscribe to the paper or you would like a copy, feel free to take one. And what this is, is all of the candidates um, that you will see when you go to the polling place and on your um, ballot, everybody ha is in here with answers to questions that we have formed that are we anticipate to be of interest to everybody um, as you're trying to decide who you're going to vote for. All right. Um, I have to tell you, to maintain our nonprofit status, we are not allowed to hold a forum for one candidate we have to have an opposing candidate. So if somebody is running and they are unopposed, we can't have them at the forum. If, if they are opposed, but the other candidate is not, will not take part, we can't, um, we can't have them at the forum, unfortunately. And as you'll find out, that has happened tonight. Um, but I also want to tell you about another forum that we're having on Sunday. It's um, going to be at Chesapeake College. It's Sunday, June 10th. Um, it's going to be in the Cadby Auditorium, and it's put on by the Combined Leagues of Kent, Midshore, and Queen Anne's Counties. And they will present two forums back-to-back -back for the U.S. House of Representatives District 1. The first forum for Republican candidates starts at 1.30, and the second forum uh, starts at 3.15 and will be the Democratic candidates. So there's a flyer on the table. Feel free to take one if you need a reminder, but it's going to be an interesting forum, I'm sure, on Sunday. Maybe not as interesting as tonight, but... <laughs> So tonight our panel consists of the following candidates. For commissioner at large, it's Ms. Helen Bennett. The incumbent commissioner is Jim Moran. For district one, it's Mr. Joe Gannon. And, and incumbent commissioner, Jack Wilson. And I'm gonna go over here so I don't hide them. <laughs> um, you see, you'll, you'll notice district two is not here. Unfortunately, um, 
Mr. George Sigler and uh, the incumbent commissioner, Steve Wilson, were both invited. And Mr. Steve Wilson um, could not attend because of a prior engagement. So that means that you're not going to be able to hear from Mr. Siegler either. But Mr. Siegler's in the audience, and he, it, here he is, and he is, has said he is willing to stay after the forum. And if you would like to talk to him, he'll be glad to shake hands and tell you all about any questions that you have for him. Thank you, Mr. Siegler. Um, OK, and then we have District 3 is Ms. Uh, Laura Bogley Nickman, Mr. Phil Duminil, I'm sorry, I'm walking around, <laughs> and Mr. Barry, Den oh, Mr. Barry Donatio is not able to be here tonight due to an in illness also. But we still have two candidates for this, this um, position, yeah. so we can go on with that. Um, and then we have District 4, and this is Mr. Chris Corkia, Corkia Reno, is that right? That's correct, good job. <laughs> That's a hard one. And incumbent commissioner Mark Anderson. So our moderator tonight is Ms. Gwyn Schultz. Um, she and her husband have been residents of Queen Anne's County for 26 years. And Gwyn was one of the founding member members of the Queen Anne's County League. And she actually served on our first steering committee, which eventually became our board of directors. Uh, she previously served as one of our past co-presidents. So I'm going to let Gwyn take over this forum, and she will explain to you all of the rules, and she will proceed with the forum. Good. Thank you. Good evening. Um, tonight's forum is divided into three sections. We're going to be starting out with the candidates' opening statements. That will then be followed by audience questions, and then we're going to have a round of cl um, closing comments by the, the candidates. Uh, I'll explain more about the ground rules of each of those sections as we go through the evening. Um, just want to ask everyone to make sure that your phones are on silent before we get started. And um, each of the candidates for their opening statements will have two minutes. And we're going to be starting with uh, Ms. Bennett. Um, and we do have timers up front, if you want to raise the, the timers. Um, pretty much everything we do this evening will be timed. So just kind of keep your eyes on the, on the women here. And also for the candidates, that's where the timers will be sitting. So um, for the opening comments, we'll be going from left to right. And for the closing comments, from right to left. All right. Our right and left, not yours. Right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start out with Helen. Thank you, Gwen. I'm going to stand. First, um, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting, and thank you for attending. Four years ago, I was on your side. My name is Helen Bennett, <coughs> and I own a local business in Chester. It's the pet shop. I do everything local. I shop local. I, I uh, commit my time and energy local. I volunteer local. I attend church local. So I say that to say I am you. I am like most of you. I have immersed myself in everything that's here in Queen Anne's County, love it, and would like to uh, do my best for Queen Anne's County. I served in the Marine Corps. I was honor graduate and Marine of the Year. And when I got out of the military, I stayed in Arlington, and I worked for the POAC, uh, which is a Pentagon officer at the athletic club. And I continued my education and got my degree at Marymount University with honors in health fitness management. And then I went on to work at Navy Federal Credit Union as their wellness coordinator at their headquarters in Virginia for four years. Then I went on to l and Health and Fitness where I was an account manager and managed 22 government businesses and uh, facilities and gyms in DC. And then um, I met this wonderful man in the audience and he moved me to to Maryland and so I've been here since 2010 and quickly fell in love with this county as I mentioned I've done a lot of stuff all my stuff is done in Queen Anne's County I wanted to serve my country and that is why I joined the Marine Corps and as corny as it sounds that's why I'm running now is because I want to serve my county so I ask for your vote on June 26 and I thank you very much for your time Hello, everybody, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this on for this evening. My name is Jim Moran, and I've been your at-large county commissioner for five years. So you have five years of my track record. www.citizensforjimmoran.com. Look at the accomplishments. Look at all the different boards I've served on. 
this, this election is about leadership. This election is about leadership and where this county is moving forward to. We've come a long way in the four years. I, I, I want to thank the city commissioners with, with me here tonight. Balanced budgets, a AAA bond rating, sewer system, been kicked down the road for 40 years, finally done, a courthouse finally done. County's in great fiscal health, and we want to keep it going that way. So I'm asking for your support to keep us in the same direction we're headed, and I thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Gannon. I was born and raised on a farm. My family's been in this area for over 200 years, mostly all farmers. I've been married for 35 years. I have two boys and two grandchildren. It's very important to, for me to preserve the family farm. If I'm elected, a couple things that I'd like to try to get done is I would definitely pledge not to raise the property taxes. I would also like to lower the income taxes. We are the highest in the state of Maryland. We need to also work on the traffic issue. It's horrendous. And it's with a, a bypass in Middletown coming, 301 is going to be bad too. We need to work on improving school safety. And I'd like to see more young people get involved into the county government. The biggest issue I have is I think there should be more of an open door policy. If you come in front of the commissioners and you have a question, it should be answered within 24 hours. I might not have all the answers when you come to me, but I will find the right person to get the answers and get them back to you. Please remember me on election day, Joe Gannon. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, League of Women Voters, for hosting this tonight, and thank you all for showing up and taking time out of your busy evenings. I know uh, politics is probably the last thing everybody really wants to think about on a Thursday night. Um, as my placard says, I'm Jack Wilson. I presently represent District 1 on the County Commission. I'm serving as Vice President on the Commission. And instead of standing up here talking about what I've done for the last four years, I kind of want to tell you why I want to serve for four more years, and actually only three years to set the record straight. Um, there's two things that uh, I campaigned on when I ran last time and things that I've worked on this time. And they're both, I'm very passionate about both, and anybody in here that knows me has heard me talk about them on different occasions, especially at commissioner meetings. First one is broadband connectivity. That's the one thing that I have, uh, I thought we had it done a year ago. Unfortunately, in the 11th hour, it fell apart. And that was a sad day for the county because for this county to move forward in the future, and I'm a forward thinker, we have to have connectivity to every home and business in this county. Otherwise, the growth that happens on Kent Island is going to continue there because that's where the infrastructure is. We've got to think outside the box. I presently serve as the Broadband Advisory Commission, newly established liaison, and we will work hard. Whether I'm here after November or not, we're going to work hard for the next six months to make sure everybody's got broadband. The second item, one that I that's near and dear to my heart because I am come from a blue-collar background, and that's workforce development, alternative career paths for our youth coming out of high school. We've been focusing the last three months now, we've done several tours with the youth, and the response has been incredible. And I'm very proud to say that Queen Anne's County is doing things that other counties aren't doing. So I want to continue down those road on those two issues. I look forward to seeing you at the polls, and I uh, appreciate your support on June 26th. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Nickman. I'm running for County Commissioner in District 3. Uh, my husband Patrick and I have lived here for the last 16 and a half years. We've raised our three boys here in the public school systems. Um, I am running for your County Commissioner and asking for your vote on the 26th because I believe we need to be more competitive. Queen Anne's County needs some uh, advanced leadership um, to become more competitive. And I don't want to be more competitive to change Queen Anne's County or grow it. I don't want to look like Anne Arundel. I don't want to look like D.C. I want to listen to the will of the people and that, that we want to stay a quintessentially rural county. Um, but in order to preserve the county that we love, we need a stronger local economy. And that's something that I'll work very hard on. Um, there are many opportunities going on right now in the state that we can take advantage under Governor Hogan's, le Hogan's leadership. He's doing a lot of great things. He's creating new jobs, inviting businesses to come back into our state. Queen Anne's County needs to be poised and ready to take advantage of those opportunities for the infrastructure improvements, for the higher wage jobs, um, all sorts of opportunity, workforce development, as Jack mentioned. 
Um, and we need to be ready to do that. We need a higher skill set to be able to take advantage of that and compete on a regional basis. And so I want to be your county commissioner because I do have a broad base of experience and skills. Um, I've been a public policy professional in the field for the last 20 years. I've worked at all levels of government from county to state and federal. Um, I know how government works. I know how the different branches need to interact. Um, I have budget experience because I've staffed and served as Chief of Staff of the Maryland General Assembly uh, for Delegate Aaron. So before that I was Legislative Staff for um, Senator Hershey. Um, I've worked in support of the House Appropriations and Budget Committee. Um, and I also served on the Maryland State Economic Development Association. So I have really strong skills and an extensive network of professional development um, and economic development um, resources. So we want to take advantage of that, grow our local economy so we can keep your taxes down and continue to pro provide quality essential services for our residents. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Phil Dumanel, and I'm running for county commissioner as well in District 3. Uh, I have um, three children. I, too, have lived here for 16 years in Queen Anne's County. Uh, my children have attended the school systems here. I had uh, my oldest son graduated from Ken Island High School last year. My daughter's attending the high school as a sophomore next year, and I have a son who's in the middle school. As a sitting commissioner from 2011 to 2014, I had the opportunity to serve on four separate different uh, commissions here in Queen Anne's County uh, for four years as the commissioner. Commission on Aging, Commission Parks and Recs Advisory Board, Department of Advisory, uh, Department of Emergency Services, um, and the Fire and MS Commission. So in addition to the responsibilities of submitting a budget to the state in July each year for four years and the daunting task of making that happen and getting our financial situation put together to the point where the sitting current commissioners could achieve the AAA bond rating when they started with the AA bond rating that we set in place when we left office. So experience is what I bring as a sitting commissioner in the past and I want to be your commissioner in the third district for the next four years. June 26, please vote for Phil Dumano, County Commissioner, District 3. My name is Mark Anderson. I'm the current sitting commissioner in District 4. I bring uh, a wealth of experience <coughs> for doing this job. Uh, I'm the senior citizen here right now, 74. I've got a wealth of background in business, in a uh, government operation the size of Anne Arundel County, and we don't want to go that direction. Uh, if you look at what this commission has accomplished, and my colleagues have mentioned this, we have welded together, uh, despite differences, uh, we agree uh, to disagree, but agreeably. We have done a good job and the direction of this county is in the right direction. Uh, the uh, background, I don't want to bore you with uh, all these years of uh, service and various items, but www.votemarkanderson.com, uh, it's got it all there. I have not missed a single meeting or vote uh, since I was sworn in in December four years ago. I am known to be detailed, sometimes to the aggravation of uh, my uh, colleagues because of digging into things and getting questions that are really good. I also appreciate that on TV, when you have all these acronyms and so forth that get flying back and forth, the public is looking and don't understand what it is that's being talked about, and I'll slow it down so that people will understand, you, the folks out there, who I represent, every one of you. And being a full-time person, what you see in forums, what you see in meetings, is only a part of this. Being a full-time commissioner requires uh, full-time effort. My phone rings, I answer it, and I solve problems. And I'm good at it, and I want to return to do that for you. Good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and for all of you for coming out here. My name is Chris Corcorino. I'm running for County Commissioner in District 4 because the decisions made by the next group of commissioners is more important than just the next four years of their term. 
it affects our community for the next 10, 20, and 30 years. And that's the community that my three daughters are growing up in and hopefully the community that they're going to plant their roots in and, and raise their own family in. And I want to be a part of building that future. Uh, I'll bring to the county, uh, the county commissioners the voice of somebody who is a product of this county. I graduated down the street from here, Queen Anne's County High School, uh, in the class of 1992. Over the years, I have forged experiences and relationships with people through all out the county. Uh, I bring the voice of a parent with three school-age children who attend Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Um, as an attorney, I deal with complex litigation, lawsuits that involve multi-million dollars at risk and multiple parties with varying interests and opinions. And not only do I have to advocate for my clients, but I have to collaborate with all of the other parties to find a path towards a resolution. And I think that's a skill that the county commissioners could use because we have a great citizen base with lots of different opinions and lots of different viewpoints. And the county commissioners need to have an open mind and be able to listen to all those viewpoints and then collaborate with the citizens and their other commissioners in order to find a path towards a resolution for the challenges that affect our county. Prior to becoming an attorney, I was in uh, the restaurant business. I was a small business owner. I understand the challenges of small businesses. Are you going to make payroll? Uh, too much government regulation bogging you down. And I understand that the entrepreneurial spirit is what drives economic development. I want to foster that spirit in this county. So Queen Anne's County is a place that businesses want to move to, start up, and grow at. To do that, I need your vote, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Right. This, okay, we're going to start now the question and answer part of our agenda, and I'll give a, quickly go through the guidelines for this part. Um, if you're interested in asking a question, please come up to the microphone and introduce yourself and where you live, and you'll have 45 seconds to pose your question, and we do have the timers here, and they'll be flagging you down if, if you go over. Um, questions should be posed to one candidate. And that individual will have one and a half minutes to respond. Then the candidate's opponent will be given one minute to address the question if he or she chooses. So when asking your question, um, please don't use this as an opportunity to address specific personal situations, but rather ask questions that are going to be of more interest to the general voting public. And then also please refrain from providing kind of personal comments and opinions on the issue. Um, so finally, uh, you may get real excited about an answer, but please hold your applause until um, the end of the forum, and because that will just, any applause will kind of take time from all the question and answer time that we ha have allotted to tonight's forum. Um, so with that, um, I see we have somebody here, and then if folks are interested, you might want to have like one more person kind of in line um, for the question. All right, so we'll get started. My name is Jim Beecham. I live in Centerville. I'll pose my question to candidate Bennett. The Maryland Department of Transportation is currently doing phase one of an extended study looking to identify potential corridors for a new Bay Bridge crossing. Notwithstanding and with no regard for what their technical answer might be, what is your opinion of how that should be handled, where that third span should go, and how do we deal with the intervening time between now and 20 years from now when that bridge may be open? Thank you. No, thanks, Jim. It's a great question. Um, I don't think that Ken Island is a place for the third span. I know that they are doing the studies. I understand that there's a couple of places that would like to have that third span, and um, that's great that they want it, and that's a good place for them, and they should probably build it there. In the meantime, though, I know that <coughs> There is a lot of traffic issues, and it's throughout the entire uh, county. It's not just, you know, Ken Island, the bottleneck. <clears throat> it's here. It's North County as well. But I think that there are a lot of local small things that we can do that can ease the, um, the traffic here on, a, on a, a local level. We just keep saying that it's a state highway, that they're all tourists. It's, it's, there's nothing that we can do. And in my time here on Earth, I found that rarely is there not something that we can do about everything. We just need to be willing to maybe look at other options and then just get to it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm willing to 
give my minute to my opponent if she would like to tell us what those options are and how she wants to implement them. Well, I think that um, without being able to know all of the ins and outs of everything, because I don't, I'm not privy to everything, um, there are provisions for count some of the counties when you have a state road and it says that it's detrimental if there is something going about the road that's making it dangerous, that you can actually have your local uh, law enforcement help with that road. And there are some counties in Maryland that don't have to even ask permission to take that over. We are not one of them. I'm not sure why we're not. But um, why can we not do local access, open up our exits and entrances when there's 50 traffic and, and divert some of it over to the Mattapique Business Park that's owned by the county? Um, can we look at a couple areas like the Postal Road becoming one way? Um, can we put the local access signs up anyway, even though, you know, they don't hold any weight law, you know, lawful wise, but some people wouldn't go there. Um, we started looking at the Cox Creek connector and I think that's a good option. Um, so that's my time's up, but thank you. Hey, thank you. <coughs> Steve Donovan, Centerville. While we're on this topic, I want to go to Jack. Um, because we're talking about a new bridge and whether we want it here or somewhere else, my bigger issue is that Delaware is going to be flooding us with a lot of traffic in about a year. Um, we have a bridge that was built in 52 that its capacity is, is coming to an end whether we like it or not. And the other one I think was 83. So we really need to be creative in this. And I, I, I just, I guess the, pet, the question I want to pose to you is what do you anticipate? What do you see? I know that you're working on a lot of stuff uh, up in North County and, and how we're going to deal with all that. Um, so it's kind of a loose question, but. Well, one of my biggest concerns, Steve, and thanks for the question, is, and I, and, and I actually started this and raised the awareness of this two and a half years ago at our first SHA meeting that we had at the commissioner's office, because at that time, really, no one even knew what the Middletown bypass was. And I, I had been up in Middletown, and I actually heard about it, and I brought it to the attention of SHA at that time. And there were a lot of uh, head shaking and jaws dropping because really nobody knew anything about it. Well, the long and short of it is, as far as uh, the number of vehicles we're likely to see, um, your guess in this room is as good as Delaware and uh, state of Maryland because nobody knows. Um, I've heard estimates of 12,000 to 42,000 per month additional cars coming south on 301. And, and, and those cars are going to wind up at the Bay Bridge. So we already know what the impact's going to be up there. I, don't, I think that uh, pretty much tells you on a Sunday afternoon it's only going to get worse. And the big difference is that it's going to be every day of the week, whereas right now we suffer through Sundays. But when you add 42,000 cars every day of the week, it's going to get worse. My biggest concern, though, Steve, is the at-grade intersections that we have from Delaware to the 50 split. Those intersections are dangerous now. There's many accidents at 405, which I cross almost daily. Um, the helicopter's there at least twice a month. Um, and that's my biggest concern, and it's been raised at SHA. We've beat on SHA. What are you going to do? Are you going to put J-turns? You've got to give us some answers because December of 18, they're coming. And right now, I, I, you know, I, I hate to see the number of people that we may be taking away in our emergency services. So, Yes, that is going to be an important issue. And... Like my opponent, I agree you'd need to probably have some J-turns on 301, but in taking into consideration, the state needs to understand about these J-turns, the farm equipment. Some of these guys can't really make that turn with the big equipment they have nowadays, which they need for all the ground they need to tell and everything. As far as where to put the bridge, I, if you look at, take a map and look at like La Plata, Maryland, Southern Maryland, and go right straight across, you come down below south of Cambridge. Believe it or not, those people down in Southern Maryland want the bridge to go down there, and I think that's where it should go. And as a commissioner, I would fight to have it go down there. There's no way I would I would let it come to Queen Anne's County. Thank you. Good evening, Martha Anthony. I live in Centerville. This question's for Mr. Corcorino. With um, all the recent shootings that have been in the United States, school shootings, that sort of thing, what kind of initiatives or what kind of plan do you have to ensure school safety? Okay. And thank you. Having 
three girls who attend Mattapique Elementary School. Uh, school safety is obviously something that's very important to me. Um, and, and I think what we've heard recently is that the Board of Education, the Sheriff, and the County Commissioners have already taken steps to improve school security, including resource officers, which will eventually be stationed at all of the locations. Um, and I, I agree with that. Uh, something else that's been talked about that I don't agree with is adding metal detectors to all schools. Um, I, I, there are a lot of studies out there that talk about the detrimental effect that that has psychologically on the students. It also creates a false sense of security for people that because there's a metal detector, you don't have to worry about it. But as we've seen in many school shootings, if you have one person from the school who is there, a man in the metal detector, and a crazy person's coming in with a gun, they're gonna shoot that person and walk through the metal detector. It does not offer you any support. You also have to make sure a metal detector is being monitored 24 seven because when you have after school events, that provides an opportunity for someone to come in and plant weapons. And you can't also overlook the fact that when the kids are out there at recess or they're dropping off from school or they're loading up from school, that's a mass attack right there. And you may encourage a gunman to come to that where you're gonna have much more mass casualties than them going through the school. So I think a resource officer is important. I don't like the idea of metal detectors. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Most of you uh, will have received, if not today, tomorrow, this letter from the Queen Anne's County Commissioners indicating uh, the concern for school safety. Uh, our sheriff has managed to, to have provided coverage in all of our schools <coughs> for the end of this school year. It's incumbent upon us going forward uh, to do what's necessary uh, to cover the schools in, 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 a, in a good way. We're already doing a lot. Uh, the sheriff is doing a lot. None of it can, can we talk about. Uh, this is an important uh, issue to and more than an issue, it needs something to have to be done. And I would make this one further comment. Uh, having spent uh, 90 minutes listening to the principal from Columbine High School, <coughs> parents need to be involved in this as well. Parents need to know what their kids are up to and what they're doing. So I think it's a team effort. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone coming up for a question? Okay, well, I'm going to ask one. Oh, are you going to come up? Okay. <laughs> sure is uh, don't jinx. Say that's a little too easy. Steve, <laughs> Steve, can you bring the microphone to him? Or? <coughs> See, this here, that's what's causing the He's here. Oh, it's close to that. oh, it's off, though. There you go. Oh. Something was back feet. <laughs> My name is Nick that, Storr. It's off. You have to use that one. Yes. 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 My name is Nick Storr. I live in Chester, uh, which uh, in District 3. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, it's a traffic-related question, uh, but besides the, all the traffic coming down from Delaware and, and coming up from the ocean, we, we're generating more and more traffic on, on Ken Island with approval of uh, new housing divisions. Uh, there's issues dealing with uh, possibly converting uh, the Lowry Farm into a town center of, of hundreds of apartments, and and uh, the, uh, the the uh, the subdivision uh, <clears throat> just being developed uh, on uh, Route 18 uh, uh, around the the traffic circle. Um, what, from a planning standpoint, when you look at the 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 commissioners that are going to be elected in this election are going to be in charge of, of shaping uh, the comp plan for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, how are you going to deal with managing down the growth of additional housing and additional traffic, particularly on, on Kent Island in District 3 and District 4? Uh, that seems to be we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're worrying about traffic from Delaware, but we're creating more and more traffic problems ourselves. How are you going to solve that problem? And who are you asking that? Which, which candidate? I, I would put that with uh, Laura Bogley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Storr. 
Um, obviously, traffic is a problem countywide, but particularly for the residents on Kent Island. So everyone understands that they need some relief, some remedy for, for the congestion. Uh, this next set of county commissioners is going to have the opportunity to do the review and update with the communities um, and the citizen advisory councils for the new comprehensive plan update for our land use plan. That's going to be extremely important. Um, you know, we've talked about this in various forms, and a lot of people uh, that are running for office are saying the same thing, that managed growth is healthful to the county. It brings jobs, opportunities, um, increases our um, economic, our commercial tax base, so that we don't always have to co keep coming to the taxpayers and asking for more in the way of property tax and income tax. Um, that being said, it needs to be managed, and particularly on Kent Island. With the projects we already have in the pipeline now with the Four Seasons project, which is going to be, uh, it's slated for an additional 1,100. You can double that number. That's an additional 2,000 vehicles on the road. Um, uh, Kent, Southern Kent Island sewer. Again, we're looking at 1,500 homes um, that are going to be able to have um, the sewer connection, and that may be an additional 500, 600 lots that are buildable. Um, so we need to find a way to in, um, manage growth, no, probably um, in an area where there's a greater demand, north of the 5301 split. Um, areas like Sudlersville and Centerville that want the additional amenities. I want to work with those communities, find out where the demand is, and then provide remedy for the folks on Kent Island from the tra traffic congestion. Thank you. So um, that is a great question, Nick. Um, the, um, the comprehensive plan is going to play a huge role in what our community is going to look like in the future as far as growth. What kind of growth, where the growth is going to be, how much growth. Um, you, have, you have the acronyms that Commissioner Anderson spoke about earlier, the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance or the APFO. That's kind of a measure of standard that has to be met um, before a project can be moved forward in its planning stages. And if there is some changes that need to be made to accommodate this project, then necessary changes to the infrastructure in order to meet these APFO standards for this project to move forward. So working closely with um, a, a potential blue ribbon panel that can take a look at the comprehensive plan and how that's going to move forward and where we're going to move forward on is something that I will make a commitment to as your commissioner in the third district. Any questions? Okay, um, what I'd like to do then is, um, with regard to the question that was asked earlier about the Bay Bridge, um, opinion on the third span, I'd like to offer the candidates from district, district three and four maybe one minute each, um, if you so choose, to respond to that. Where do we start? Start here? Sure. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't favor uh, the new bridge crossing coming to Kent Island. Um, I, I don't think it will solve our traffic problem. I think putting it lower shore down to Georgetown makes sense. I think you pull traffic in from Northern Virginia that doesn't all the, already go to Ocean City, that will start going to Ocean City, creating more ter tourism dollars, and that can be a justification for the expense for the state to have to build the infrastructure down there. Um, that said, we have a traffic problem now on Ken Island from all the through traffic. And the county um, has had traffic studies performed and traffic engineers have come up with different measures to ease the traffic. You're not going to get rid of the traffic. I've lived on Ken Island for, Ken Island for 30 years and we've always had traffic from the through traffic. But there are ways that we can ease it to make the daily lives of our citizens better during the summertime. But the problem with what we have to remember is it is the through traffic that's our problem, which is generated by the state. It's going to cost tens of millions of dollars to implement these traffic measures, and the state's the one that has to shoulder the burden because the state is the one that's putting the burden of the through traffic on us. Well, like Chris, I live there as well. The Bay Bridge issue is two layers. Layer one is where's the next bridge going and all the infrastructure and so forth associated with it. Uh, we have people, uh, Jim Moran, uh, involved in that macro view. We have counters uh, up and down the road counting traffic. So we actually know what kind of traffic is going through our county, when and what time. There's another phase of this, and that's the short-term fix. Uh, <coughs> I'll raise it again, I raised it many times before. 
A county cannot put restrictions on a road unless it owns it. We have bypass roads that are filled by apps that tell people, get off this road and go in this area. If we owned those roads, and I have a very good reason to believe this county will be able to obtain them for nothing, uh, we can put restrictions on bay traffic, and that's an easy way to do it. We need to explore that. Um, as Jim has mentioned in the past, as well as Commissioner Anderson just now, this traffic is not our traffic. This is the state's traffic. This is a through traffic that's heading to Ocean City and to the Delaware Shore Points. Um, I, I think a bridge uh, anywhere near the two existing spans that we have already would just <coughs> aggravate the situation as it is. Somewhere north of, of uh, where it's located now or even better further south. Um, but certainly not anywhere near where the existing ba bridge spans are now. Thank you. At your county commissioner from District 3, I'm going to assume responsibility for this bridge traffic. We're hearing from a lot of the other candidates that it's the, the state's traffic, that's true. It's the state's responsibility, that is true as well. But all of us know that if we wait for a remedy from the state, we're looking at another 16, 20 years out. And who knows if that'll be a palatable solution for Queen Anne's County. Kent County is, uh, is advocating very actively against having the third span there. Dorchester County, some segments of it, want the third bridge span there. Um, so I want to take ownership of this. I want to provide a re relief, a remedy for our local residents starting now. And that's going to be multi-tiered. And many of the pe people at this table have had good suggestions. I do think the best one is, as Commissioner Anderson mentioned, a feasibility study to look into the county taking ownership of those local roads so we can use them as local-only local, local only traffic roads, similar to like a Dulles Parkway situation where you have a pass and only locals can use it. But there are several other um, initiatives that we need to work with the community on. Ways, the Cox Creek connector, metering traffic, as Commissioner Moran has suggested, and also the uh, peak pricing on the bridge. But I'll take responsibility for this starting first day in office. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is for uh, Mr. Corcorino. The uh, affordable, I'm sorry, my name is Bob Friday. I'm with the Bay Area Association of Realtors here in Queen Anne's County. Uh, affordable housing is an issue here in the county as well as through the whole state. Um, do you have any thoughts about affordable housing and things that we could do in order to create housing for people who can't afford three, four, and five hundred thousand dollar houses? Yes, and thank you for the question. Uh, workforce housing is a is a it's a community issue. It's a traffic issue. It's an economic development issue. Um, for economic development, if we don't have workforce housing, we're lacking some of the entry level workforce that businesses need in order to start here and grow here, and that's a problem. It's a traffic problem because we have people who work in our county, but they live outside the county and they got to drive in. That creates more of a problem. And it's a community issue because we have members who, uh, of our law enforcement and our teachers who aren't living in our community. They're living outside because they can't find housing here. One of the, I attended a seminar the other day, and one of the um, issues that was brought up is in Frederick County, they're using land trusts in order to create a public-private partnership in order to lower the cost of housing. Because one of the problems that you face here with, with workforce housing is um, for a developer to build a property, they have an enormous amount of cost before they even get to the profit level. You're paying for engineers, you're paying for architects, you're paying for land players, land uh, planners, you're paying for the acquisition costs, you're paying for permits, and on and on. And before you know it, you're over $100,000 before you even start building the property. So then it makes very difficult to make affordable housing. And let's face it, the private sector, they want to make a profit, and there's nothing evil about wanting to make a profit. <laughs> But what we can do is we can partner with them with the land trust. So the land is owned in a public trust. So it's almost like a ground lease. And that will reduce the cost of the housing. And I think that is a plan that we should be exploring here. Um, in particular, maybe uh, might be able to do that somewhere here in Centerville. Believe it or not, many of our citizens live here because of the amenities and work elsewhere. Chris, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, and many of us uh, uh, do that. And it's because of the amenities that are provided here. Uh, some of the housing is very expensive. Uh, our school system, uh, the, the entire uh, way of life here is very appealing. And 
as far as workforce housing, we had an, uh, uh, a project at Slippery Hill. And as was mentioned, the front end loaded expense for that type of housing caused that whole deal to come apart. The, you have to wonder whether the housing needs to be here first or the people who are gonna fill it need to be here first. Vocational education in our high schools is a hell of a way to, to start having a home-based group of people who will fill a factory or an assembly line or some form of clean business that we want. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Rinelli. I live in Stevensville, and my question is for Mr. Moran. Uh, Mr. Moran, uh, in some of your social media statements you've published over the past six years as an elected official, uh, you have publicly, wrongly, and unfairly ridiculed some citizens with whom you have had political disagreements. So my question to you is, how can voters be assured that you've changed and will no longer disparage your own constituents, and how can you better be a better public leader for Queen Anne's County? Thank you. Well, that's an interesting question, uh, loaded with a lot of innuendos. If you, if you want to forward those to me, I'll be happy to answer that question, but... Right here, if you like. I, let's not get into that. That's, more, mm -hmm. uh, that's a yeah. personal issue. I don't think we should get into that. Tonight. But I'll tell you what, I'll take the time, since you asked the question, to address some of the traffic. And I have been working on I'm on the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. Uh, everyone th seems to think that if Queen Anne's County doesn't want something or Queen Anne's County does want something, the state's going to say yes. And that's not, the pr that's not the way it works. It, there's a process with the state. Right now, there's a law on the books that says the majority of the Eastern Shore counties can deny the location of the bridge wherever it goes. Kent County's trying to get a law passed right now. They tried last year, they'll try again this year, to say that there's gonna be no bridge going there. We can try the same thing, absolutely. But you gotta remember, we're 16 years away right now from when that will happen, when a new bridge will happen, if it goes where it's, it's permitted. And, and I'm gonna use that word loosely, because if you're talking about Dorchester, the environmental area down there, that'll be locked up in court for 10 to 15 years. This traffic that we have is gonna be every Sunday. We have asked the state over three times, and, and now we have legislation, or excuse me, our legislators involved that's pushing the state for metering of traffic on Sunday nights. We can get the state roads. The state will give us Route 18, but then we maintain Route 18. It's a huge cost to the county. Also, now you have to, you have to put sheriff at each one of the exits to stop people from getting on and off. We can get rid of the apps. We can get all the people to get rid of the apps. The people that are jumping on our side roads are those commuters for Weekend Ocean City, and they know the roads. They don't need the apps. Um, Ms. Bennett, how about, um, if you so choose, maybe kind of focusing on the traffic issue? Well, I spoke about the traffic issue, and um, I think that if we had not approved so many apartments, if we would stop approving mixed-use developments, if we would stop approving all the um, apartments, we did 1,200 just last year, that, and as I think Laura mentioned, that brings 2,000 cars every single day, um, that adds to the traffic congestion. And so we have to look at what our part is. And as I said, we have to look at what little things that we can do about all these issues. Um, and I talked about some of the traffic stuff that we can do, but I too would take responsibility for it because I think that we can do better for our citizens. Uh, we shouldn't have to be gridlocked. And it's not just Sundays. Um, as we've seen, it's, it's uh, frequently, I mean, state just came and did something down Route 8 yesterday. And was that really the best day and the best time? Could we not have had some coordination that they were not tying up our school buses and making a dangerous situation at, uh, at 3 and 4 in the afternoon on a weekday? Uh, so I think that there are things that we can do, and we just need to build those relationships and, and work together, state, local, the citizens, um, and come up with some solutions. And I think that we can do it. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Friday, President of the Queen Anne County Chamber, and this question is for Commissioner Wilson. Um, you had mentioned workforce. Uh, what is your vision for developing workforce for our students? That is a great question, of which I do have an answer for. Um, <coughs> so what we've done so far, I'm going to give you the Reader's <coughs> Digest version. I started two years ago on this. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a, a trades background, so I'm very passionate about the trades. Um, we reached out to the schools, we reached out to the college to uh, create programs that offer students who aren't going to college, who aren't four-year college, you know, bound type of people, dual enrollment if they enter into a trade or learn manufacturing or cybersecurity as a certificate. 
And, and the response was fantastic, but unfortunately, it's been slowed a bit because we've had three different uh, board superintendents recently, and we've had our, we're on our second college president. But I will say that within the last month and a half, two months that we've done these uh, tours with the students to local businesses, um, it, the, the response has been fantastic. So I look forward to the workforce development moving forward and, and to be so brave as to say that in the 2019-2020 school year, I foresee it being uh, coming to fruition and probably having in excess of 40 students involved, which I think is fantastic because just the other day we had 30 freshmen take a tour of Patriot Fire and NRL and Associates and seem very genuinely interested in some of the other opportunities that are out there. So I will continue to work on that. Um, like I said, that's one of the reasons I'm running for four more years is because I want to see that through. I want to see this county have a bright future with our youngsters. You know, not everyone is set out to go to college. It's great that you can do that. But you know what? We, we need to keep these farms alive. You know, the average farmer nowadays is over 60 years old. We have 155,000 tillable acres in Queen Anne's County. We need to protect and preserve this. By doing that, we need to go get along with the FFA and the schools, promote more farming with young people and everything, get involved in the 4-H clubs, really concentrate on getting more young farmers to stay here in the county and protect our family farmland. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Question? Oh. Oh. Okay, go ahead. I'll speak again. <laughs> I'm not shy. Steve Donovan, Centerville. I want to direct this to Jim because we heard a few people up here uh, talking and about budgets and AAA and AA bond rating. And I'd like to actually have you ex kind of explain what we say by going from a two to a three uh, and the impact it does for the debt that we carry and that type of thing. Because at the end of the day, if there's no growth, you're dying. So you have to have growth. So I want to throw that Well, out. you're absolutely right. I mean, and and we can call it smart growth, we can call it whatever you want, but we just cannot be choked with no growth. That's what killed Queen Anne's County approximately eight years ago, uh, 10 years ago, excuse me. And you know, you, just like tonight, we talked about workforce housing. Well, there's, there was a question about workforce housing. Well, apartments act like workforce housing. Those that can't afford houses go to apartments. When I was on the Planning Commission, we did a study. We needed over 1,200 apartments just to meet the needs of the citizens of Queen Anne's County. So that's where those are built, and that's where those were filled, and that's our workforce development. As far as our bond rating, it's saving us, on average, I'd say probably three to four million dollars a year in debt. You know, so I mean, it, it is huge. I mean, and we have the reserves now. If there was a hiccup in the economy, we could probably sustain that for two, maybe three years, because we're caught up on our roads, we're caught up on all of our infrastructure, so that we could pull back on some of those things we spend three and four million dollars a year at, pull back and use those, those resources somewhere else. So, you know, the county's in great shape, but uh, let's be honest, Four Seasons, Cloisters, these developments that we had nothing to do with are going to carry the county for the next three to five years. So, we, you know, we, we are in great shape moving forward. Uh, well, when you went from the double to the triple A, and it was two years ago, you were able to, we were able to, as a county, uh, refinance some of our debt at the lower rate that we could get with AAA because I mean that's what it means is we can just borrow more money at a lower rate but now you can't do that the federal government has cut that off and we can no longer refinance uh, any of our debts at the lower rate um, and we have financed a lot in this last year the courthouse I think they even put if I understood at the last forum we've even put some vehicles to the tune of 1.2 million on a bonds um, for debt um, so Yes, it's nice to have the AAA, but it just meant that we borrowed more money. And I don't think that's a good place for us to be. And the courthouse is probably going to explode to even uh, larger amounts that we owe. The apartment housing, it's nice, but the mixed developments that have been approved are mostly luxury apartments. Uh, we just uh, awarded something for Jim DiDonato. The uh, promenades have lower uh, rates, but a lot of the apartments are even outside the 30% that you're supposed to spend on your um, on your income, on your housing. So we have a ways to go, and we have some work that we can do. Thank you. This is directed to, my name is Elaine Studley, and I moved here three years ago. This is directed to Commissioner Wilson. Um, when I moved here, I left behind a small tech firm in DC. Um, and the reason I left it behind was that I knew I couldn't provide the level of service that my clients required. 
I came out here because I felt it was a really wonderful right place for technology. And when I say technology, I mean small tech. Small technology firms are now beginning to move out from cities. Um, I had hoped to come here and start a small tech firm, possibly. It was one of the things that I still am working on a little bit. What affects me the most, and firms like me, such as Corsica Technologies, um, thank heaven we have them, I think one of the reasons to have them is because they would fit our carbon footprint well. Uh, the small tech firm really is one of the ways of the future for us. The greatest single concern... The, your question? It likes me. No. Um, okay. My gosh, it doesn't like me. Uh, the It'll greatest concern I have but, but the future go, of... Saying go closer, actually. Or come closer. Okay. Uh, bandwidth. Where is it in our future? How soon can we expect it? And how do we overcome what's been holding it up? Boy, that's a loaded question. Um, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, so uh, bandwidth, for those that aren't familiar, is the actual amount of data that you can get across any uh, within, like, as for an example, one gigabyte. That's one million bytes, right? So that's what you get. Now, if you've got 10 people on that one gigabyte, now everybody's roughly at 100 megabits per second. So that's kind of how bandwidth works. The more dense areas, the bandwidth gets chewed up quicker. I think that's what Elaine's referring to, is, is especially in Centerville areas. So one of the biggest things we looked at as commission when we went down the road and said we were going to make this a fiber county, much as Kent County did, was just that. Provide enough bandwidth in all parts of the county to allow economic development in all parts of the county. That's one of our biggest restrictions right now. We have, for, for most people don't even know it, we have three towns that have sewer and water and have plenty of land to develop commercial properties on. There's just one thing they're missing. They don't have the broadband connectivity. People that live in North County, raise your hands. Yeah, no uh, connectivity in North County. It's horrible. And the way we get around it is, well, we tried it once, it didn't work. So we're backing up and we're rebooting. So we have a broadband advisory board. We ha and it's filled with tech people, people that know what they're talking about. We are working towards looking at existing assets, how we can utilize them, how we can further uh, spread them out around the county, and then we're looking at new technologies and see what we can do with those. But to, to be honest with you, I'm, in five years, I would hope that we have most of the county covered. Wow, what more can I say? I think he answered every, uh, I definitely agree with everything my opponent has said here on that issue, so there's really no more to say. My name is Eliana Ranelli, and I am from Stevensville. Hi, my name is Eliana Ranelli, and I'm from Stevensville. There, people walk from Clover, Cloverfields to Historic Stevensville for things like Ken Island Day, and they have to either walk on the road or on the edge of the others' yards. What do you think we could do? to improve that. This question is for Ms. Bogley Nickman. Thank you, Ms. Ranelli, for the question. I appreciate it. Um, it's an issue for everyone in downtown Stevensville. We want to promote um, our historic uh, areas. Uh, we have people that come from out of town just to enjoy those areas, but the local residents want to do it too. And it's not walkable. And all of the standards now with smart growth talk about walkable communities. Um, so I think about this every day as I'm driving through Stevensville and how we can improve the safety. I see students walking to the high school and the middle school on those roads, and I always worry for their safety. I see bicyclists. Um, and they're between the, the cars and the trench, so I worry about their safety. I think a great option for downtown Stevensville, rather than try to secure those easements um, on um, Love Point Road or Old Love Point Road, would be maybe to put some type of path or sidewalk and try to find the, get those easements on State Street, running parallel. Um, and then possibly residents could connect from the trail um, and come right down straight, uh, State Street, and they can access the schools, they can access the library, they can access the downtown commercial area, restaurants, um, and fully enjoy their community. Thank you. Um, yes, that was a great question, young Ranelli. Um, when I was a commissioner in Queen Anne's County, Stevensville was declared an arts and entertainment district. And this is why you see some of the changes that took place in downtown Stevensville as far as making some traffic uh, changes, as far as direction, 
building uh, sidewalks so that there was the availability of foot traffic so someone could park their car and then walk to downtown Stevensville from the east side. Um, because Stevensville is considered an arts and entertainment district, there is funding from the State Department, I mean from State Roads, uh, in order to put those sidewalks in. So I think one of the commitments that we would make um, is to address the issue with the state and get the funding because we are an arts and entertainment district in downtown Stevensville. Okay. I'll take a turn. <laughs> back up. Okay, my name is Barbara Sharkey and I live in Centerville. And um, something near and dear to my heart is the environment. As I'm seeing more and more restrictions taking off, taken off of environmental concerns, um, I'm very concerned about this area. And I would like to know what you think we can do to increase the, the um, environment, be more aware of um, keep the bay cleaner, keep our rivers cleaner, as well as the air and the, the streets and the water and, and the, um, the farmland also. Um, I'd like to start with um, Mr. Dumino. Um, the, the environmental requirements um, as far as setbacks on where you can build along shore points and, and, uh, and uh, environmental areas uh, there are strict guidelines that are handed down by the state and the county that are enforced on any development. You have to meet these environmental requirements before you can build or plan your project. In fact, your plans in your project have to clear an environmental, an environmental panel. So um, there are checks and balances in place. I, I think that, um, again, addressing the comprehensive plan, I, I think we can uh, take a, look, a close look at um, the uh, environmental partnerships with these projects that are being that are on the, the, the drawing board to be planned to be built uh, I think you work collaboratively and compromising with some of the environmental um, entities in the county and bring the developers and the environmental concern uh, advocates to the table and come up with a compromise on these projects in other words make it a co collaborative effort uh, where they work together uh, where both are satisfied with um, with the project and the impacts that it's going to have or not have on the environment. Sure. Um, regardless of your partisan position, um, we all can appreciate that living in Queen Anne's County, um, that we should appreciate and preserve our natural environment, both our farmland, our agricultural land, and our shoreline. Um, I would probably follow, work with the community, work with our partners. Um, to follow the lead of Governor Hogan. In, most of these regulations are coming from the EPA, or Maryland Department of Environment, um, and Governor Hogan has really worked and established those partnerships um, to find common ground and find where we can do things like the nutrient management plan. Um, I'm definitely an advocate for the farmers in requiring other sources of pollutants into the bay to do their fair share of cleaning up the nutrient management. We're doing what we can here. We're on track to exceed the requirements for 2025 for nutrient management. Um, and uh, stormwater management is going to continue to be an issue with the developments. We want to make sure that the silt and sediment runoff is controlled. That's something we can do at the county level. Um, and then finally, the greenhouse gas emissions. That's something Governor Hogan has been very active with. I would partner with the governor's office and our federal partners to make sure that we're doing all we can. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the audience? My name is Emily Ammon. I'm from Chester. Um, I have two young children, so I'm interested in education. I'm newer to this area, but I moved here for the education. I do commute across the bridge to work. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, the false sense of security with metal detectors, so particularly security in this area. Um, I do fear that maybe there's a false sense of security even in just the law enforcement and the resource officers. I liked the letter. I think that make, that's a step in a direction um, to feel more comfortable as a parent. But what else is the county going to do to support education as a whole, to support um, vulnerable citizens in our, in our county? Um, 
and making sure that there's resources in education for extra social work to follow the kids not only from school to home and connect all the pieces um, for the children in our communities from the very young age all the way up because I think a lot of these students that come back to the schools to cause harm those issues started when they were very young and a lot of pieces were missed um, I'd like to direct that to I guess Chris I'll let you answer sure. that. It's an excellent question thank you um, I think we're finally getting to a time in society where we're appreciating more mental health issues um, and what needs to be done, not just to treat it, but to identify it. Um, and the earlier we can get in there, the more of an impact we can make, especially with students. And it's also an entryway that students that are exhibiting an early mental health issue may also be coming from problems with their home and getting early intervention in there might be able to help out with a lot of that and diverting some of this. So I think that the, the county, not just the Board of Education, but the county itself and the Department of Health, we can do more for adding mental health services in the schools and making sure that the students are getting the counseling that they need so we can <coughs> identify problems, but not just getting the counseling, better training for the teachers so that they have the awareness and the empowerment uh, to make the reporting that they need to do so we can identify those easier. Uh, I think you would see that, uh, you know, you can do all the security you want, all the gun control you want, but we still have people who are not right in their head who are killing our students and others. And we need to get to the root of that problem, and that is education and treatment and awareness. Again, we already have some things in place that others are only thinking about. Uh, we got ahead. We got ahead of uh, uh, the school security, and we're following up on that. But the anti-bullying uh, crew, uh, volunteers, an outgrowth of that was text to stop it. Uh, that is a anonymous texting to a uh, trained counselor to hear what's going on in the background. And they're trained to figure out what needs following up and what doesn't. Uh, there were eight potential suicides that were uh, stopped because of the text to stop it. There were a lot of other background things that people got ahead of, administrations got ahead of. Uh, the school uh, board of education has a responsibility to allocate their money to take care of the priorities. And the county commissioners and the school board are gonna start meeting earlier to go through the budget in the same kind of detail that the county commissioners go through so that we can be on the same page. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna take, oh, all right, come on up. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Bob Bennett. Actually, I'm Helen's husband. I've lived, I live in Chester, and I have lived there 45 years. Uh, same house. I've seen it really change in over that period. Um, the state did some major changes in uh, Reach the Beach program. This. And, and the thought of no growth isn't a possibility. We're going to grow. But my feelings are that our infrastructure isn't keeping up with our, our growth, the, the basic amenities. I mean, basic, basic. A lot of the uh, workforce lives over, for Chester area, lives over in Castle Marina area, and they walk from Castle Marina over to the shopping center area. That means they come down where the Four Seasons project's going in, over the bridge, and back down there. That's a dangerous situation. I'll direct this to Mr. Wilson. Uh, do we have any plans towards um, addressing the, when I say infrastructure, I mean at least not moving backwards in the way of up, up what's available to the residents that live there. Um, the increased traffic flow. Okay, so I'm assuming you're talking strictly about the Castle Marina area where the Four Seasons is? Just to clarify? Or in general on the island? Or? In general. Okay, well, I mean, right now, the, as far as Kent Island goes, I mean, most are aware that attended the KIDL forum that uh, there, there's an ordinance. There is no more residential growth on Kent Island coming. We have what we're looking at right now that's in the pipeline that's working. The, the Four Season Project does have sidewalks and associated walkways and all as part of its project plan. Um, as far as other areas in the county, we've already spoke about that. There is obviously things that can be done. 
Um, and there is grant money available for that. And those, if those are issues we can look at, we certainly will. As far as the sewer treatment plant right now, we are at or near capacity on that. So they'll, I, unlike uh, previous commissions, will not vote to increase that <coughs> capacity by a million gallons. So that will pretty much uh, set the tone for what you're going to see as far as infrastructure growth. Um, other than broadband right now, sewer and water capacity is pretty well, except we have an issue with a low water pressure uh, from the island across into Graysonville, which is going to be addressed with the, hopefully with the TIF in the Narrows area to get that uh, up, to, up to speed. So there are some projects that are going on, and, and again, that's, that's a very fluent thing is infrastructure. Um, as needs change, so does the infrastructure needs, so we have to stay ahead of them and try to address them as we uh, see fit, so. Safety, safety is a very important concern. <coughs> Excuse me. We need to get with the Sheriff's Department and find out about these people walking, what we can do or not do or whatever, because that, that's a very important issue. As far as Four Seasons goes, I was against the Four Seasons project from the start, and I said to KDIL, if they don't dot every I and cross every T, I'm going to do everything in my power to stop them. If they came to us for a variance, I would not grant it. That's a project that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to take the liberty of asking a question, um, Gwen Schultz from Stevensville. Um, as county commissioners, you really need to work effectively with the municipalities that are located within the county. So on um, this question, we'll go to our at-large members, start out with Mr. Moran. Um, going, looking into the future, where do you see one or two areas of um, working with municipalities that is going to be a little bit more intense or a little bit more work going into the future that the entire um, group will be, the commissioners would have to work with? That's a very good question because our munis municipalities is where we actually want the growth to occur in a municipality. But they have to have the utilities and they have to have the, the, the means to do that. I will say since I've been a commissioner, uh, with the last set of commissioners, my, the one year, we implemented the uh, tax offset and the town of Centerville is up to about 11 cents off of their, their county taxes uh, in duplica duplication. So, you know, that was one of the things on the tax side. As far as support, I support the, the municipalities. I will take, for instance, let's take Queenstown. I mean, Queenstown wants to do some growth, and I support that. It's in their, I believe in, in land rights, and in, in in Queenstown wants to do something inside of their, their uh, town limits. I support it. Uh, I agree with Jim Moran. I would like to work with our municipalities. That's what you want to be the commissioner for, is you want to represent the citizens that you're um, elected to take care of. Um, it would be nice, though, if the uh, non-municipalities also got a tax offset, but that's not happening. Um, we talked about the water and sewer allocation, and I just want to say real quickly, if you look at your water and sewer allocations on the website, at any given month, when you look at your Schedule A, we sometimes have thousands and thousands of gallons left of our three million, and sometimes we're in the hole. But all the numbers in between stay the same. So I would like to say that I think that when we're looking at our development, you know, Four Seasons, as Joe said, it shouldn't have happened. We rezoned over 300 critical acres into intensely developed. I think there's a lot of individual decisions that we're making that we're not thinking about all of the citizens. We're thinking about, um, and nothing, I've not seen any, um, benefits in the nine years I've been here even though we've had development and even though they say there's no development happening um, why is the town center plans up on the Queen Anne's County website if there's nothing else planned with 500 units good thank you, you gonna... one more okay we'll take one last question or maybe two two questions <laughs> my name is Chad Alvarez from Kent Island this question is for Philip Dumanel district 3 uh, Phil, you're one of the only ones on the panel, I, I'm assuming from 2011 to 2014, you inherited a 28 to $30 million shortfall that you had to figure out how to balance when you were in office. With that experience, uh, what did you learn from that shortfall, having to balance a budget that, that large, and what would you bring to the table this time around dealing with a similar situation? Well, it was certainly a daunting task. Um, the... Um, the outgoing commissioners left us in a financial situation that was, to say the least, dreadful um, because of the time restriction. Um, 
you have to take a look at the services that Queen Anne's County offers and the cost to deliver those services. Um, we looked at uh, cutting government spending. We looked at what it, the picture looked like, um, uh, funding underneath maintenance of effort and education. Uh, this uh, community task force that we put together, this county realignment task force that Jim participated in, um, was made up of local business people and experts in their field to determine where we could cut government spending, what it would look like to underfund education, and to try to find that budget shortfall. Um, I think that what moving forward, what, we, we, what I would do is make the commitment that we would never get into that financial situation again, um, that uh, we wouldn't rob the coffers to balance the budget. I think with the tax increase that unfortunately uh, took place back in that administration, uh, it has made us a, a financially stronger community. Um, the income tax and the property taxes have not been increased since then because we're in good financial shape now. So I'd make sure that that stayed the case. This is a difficult situation to address. Um, but, the, but my answer to this question is Again, the economic development, uh, expanding our commercial tax base so we will never have to um, repeat the mistakes of the past. You know, in 2012, the Eastern Shore had not yet recovered from the Obama recession. Uh, Eastern Shore families were hurting. My family was hurting. I was laid off from, from my job at the end of 2011. Um, so the, by the, uh, Phil's term of the county commissioners increasing county taxpayers income tax rate to the highest rate allowable by law the 3.2 percent that really hurt Queen Anne's County families so it was a tough time for the county but it was a tough time for the families I don't ever want to see that to happen again and to add insult to injury after raising our taxes to the highest rate allowable by law that administration also wanted to throw money away at projects like an eight million dollar YMCA um, handout um, and then voted for um, a, a salary increase for themselves um, in at their final meeting. Um, that's an insult to injury, after, adding insult to injury after so many employees had been laid off and the taxpayers were the ones who were robbed, not the coffers. I wouldn't re repeat the mistakes of the past. I will not raise your, your taxes. Thank you. Can I just have one more? <laughs> Barbara Sharkey, Centerville, and um, this actually has to do with all of you, so I'm going to go with uh, Mr. Moran, since he seems to have at large, mean, which means you're all for everything, right? So we're talking a lot about all this traffic, and it is a problem, and there's, it is a problem for the traffic coming out of our, that's, that's not under really our control, that's from outside our county but um, I'm looking at things to do inside our county and you've got some really nice state some really nice county parks um, some good restaurants but have you ever thought of a movie theater and that's my question for you all the time <laughs> uh, you know being a business owner and there's a there's a bunch of us up here businesses and I said this before businesses move where they can make money or they like where they live and they move their business there. So we can wish and hope and pray for a lot of things, but it's got to be financially viable. And as you can see with the bowling alley up, up in uh, Chestertown closing, there just isn't enough people going through the doors to make that viable. And then you're talking subsidies. So do we, do we start giving subsidies? Do we pick the winners? And I'm not for picking the winners. Uh, you know, I think that, that that's a mistake. So. You know, I, I would love to see that. I mean, I, I sat on economic development, and, and I will tell you, that's probably one of the toughest uh, uh, commissions that we have because you can't, we can be creative. We've given money away in the past. We, we had uh, uh, up to $2 million, and we gave grants, both uh, ones you pay back and ones you don't, to bring businesses here. And it just, you know, again, I think that, you know, this is my opinion. Queen Anne's County is a bedroom community. Queen Anne's County loves where we live. We all love this area. And, we, and we're very passionate about it, but a majority of us, almost 80% of us, cross that Bay Bridge every day to go to work. So, you know, I, 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 you know as a commuter, I don't mind it. You know, so I, I would say that uh, 
again, you, you've got to pick your winners, and, and I'm not going to do that for, for uh, businesses. Oh, I also sit on the Economic Development Commission. This is my fourth year, and we do get a lot of presentations from developments, and they frequently start with a movie theater, and yes, it's, it's hard to sustain them. Um, I think for me, with the Economic Development Commission, we have driving strategies that were decided by the citizens. They said it was the best returned survey they had ever done, the Beacon Study. And one of them is uh, affordable homes and workforce development, all of these things that we would like to see and we've talked about. But if you're bringing luxury apartments to the island and then on the bottom level uh, are having your movie theaters, your, uh, your small shops, you're bringing in a workforce that's not making a, a, a living wage. A lot of the tourist jobs that we have, they're not making living wages. We have got to change our focus um, and make sure that we're trying to get people here who can stay and work and live and, and we need to do it on infrastructure. Make the developments when they come, if they want to, to, to play here, they need to pay. They need to be paying money to work on our infrastructure so that people will come here. We can get broadband and bring free lanes um, IT uh, company here. So that'd be great. Okay, well, thank you. So at, at this time, I'd like to invite the candidates, um, starting with Mr. Corcorino. Corcorino. Mm -hmm. um, and you get one minute each, and we'll be going from you and then around the circle. Yeah. So I'd first like to, I'd like to thank all the candidates and the, the sitting commissioners for their service to the county and all the candidates for throwing their hats in the ring. Um, and we have our Democrat candidates out there in the audience, and I, I want to thank all of them as well. I've never been in politics before, and this has been a really great process for me. Um, I thought I knew a lot about the county, and I'm learning so much more and meeting so many more people. Um, so I feel like I've, I've already won with that. Um, I have a great deal of reverence for this county because this county has sort of made me who I am. And um, so my wife and I were talking about, you know, what could I do to help the county out? I just made the decision that I wanted to run for county commissioner. And we realized that mean I would probably have to scale back on my profession, but I was, it's sort of a, a no-brainer sacrifice that I was willing to make for the county. Um, I think my wife is about 80% sure that she's going to vote for me. Uh, I hope I've earned a couple of your votes tonight. Thank you. I don't have your wife call my wife. <laughs> in any case, uh, I'm uh, in this job because I view it as a public service. It's the end part of my contribution to the citizens of this county because it's this county in which I live. Uh, I've done a lot. Uh, I like to think of myself as a fixer. Uh, everything could use a tweak or a fix. Sometimes there are big fixes that need to be made. Uh, I was a swing vote on two very important projects, the Ken Allen Sewer Project and the courthouse. It was three to two in both instances. Uh, I am prepared and have been prepared ever since making those votes to defend them. I explained them at the time they were done. Uh, I do all the research I need. I listen well. I took actually a course on how to listen. It's a, it's a skill. And I measure all the facts coming in from both sides, make a decision, and then I'm fully prepared to defend it. And that's what you get when you put me back into office. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here this evening, uh, the League of Women Voters, for hosting this event. I didn't get a chance to, to thank everybody in the beginning on my opening statements. Um, I, my closing statements, uh, I love living in Queen Anne's County. There's a reason why it's considered the land of pleasant living. Um, there's this persona that, that people have about visiting the Eastern Shore and the uniqueness of it. Uh, it's even better when you live here. Um, but being an elected official in Queen Anne's County as a commissioner, you have to be willing to make those tough decisions, uh, intestinal fortitude. They're, they're, they're not always easy. They're not always going to be popular decisions. But you're dealing with factual information and data. And you're able to see what the decisions you're going to make, the long-term effect that they're going to have on the community, and the short-term effects that they're going to have on the community. As a fiscally conservative Republican, my entire voting life, there are things that take place in the community as a leader that aren't always popular. But you have to be willing to understand that it's the best for the community moving forward long term. A vote for Phil Duminell is a vote for experience on June 26. Thank you. 
Thank you, Barbara, and the League of Women Voters for hosting this wonderful forum. Thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. I wanted to say um, the number one thing that county government can do is provide those essential services for you, public safety, education, health, community services, aging services. In order for us to continue to provide those quality services and improve where we need, we need to be economically strong and solvent. That will be my focus for you. I want to be able to continue to provide excellent county services to you as members of the public. I'll work with you and I'll work collaboratively with my fellow commissioners. We need civil discourse back at the county level. Um, I'll work collaboratively to make sure that we continue to provide those excellent services for you. And I would ask you to consider giving me your vote on June 26th. Thank you. Two words, four years. The average shelf life of a Queen Anne's County Commissioner. <laughs> because we vote them out every four years. And there's a problem with that, because every four years we reset the way the counties run. And what I'm looking for is the support to get four more years to give some consistency in this commission with historical background that made tough decisions. When we came in and ran four years ago, we, had, we faced many more questions than we did tonight and a lot harder. Today, we've gotten rid of those. This commission got rid of a lot of the divisiveness in this county, and that's something we can walk away, whether it's June 26th or November 3rd, whatever it is, then we can be proud of, is that there's not those big issues looming over the county right now. So I would like to serve four more years so that hopefully for the next set of commissioners, we won't have that either. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you all in this room are going to determine who the next commissioner is. All your friends, all your family, they know that you're political savvy. You prove that by being here. So remember to tell them the, the things that I really stand for, that I pledge not to raise the property taxes, that I want to lower the piggyback, the income tax, that I want to preserve the family farm, work on the traffic issue, the school safety, and have an open door policy. My family, like I said earlier, has been raised, born and raised, I was born and raised on a farm. My family's been around here over 200 years. Between Talba County and Queen Anne's County, we've been here over 200 years. I, my wife and I have a burial lot in Queenstown. I'm not going nowhere. I'm going to be here forever. For, for two, yeah. So please, consider me on June 26th, Joe Gannon, District 1. Thank you. Jack's right. you got to want this job really bad. Because Queen Anne's County is like family. There's 50,000 of us, and everybody knows everybody, so you're not getting away with anything. So, you know, you get thrown under the bus a lot. I've served this county for eight years. And I'm going to say, Phil, thank you for you and your commission. What they had to do with the largest deficit of any county in the state of Maryland and, and what we went through to cut $6 million of spending, and you're right, we had to lay people off. But that's a hard, you can't not do it and shut government down. So I hear this all the time about the piggyback tax. Well, we are now, the county is now part of the MS4 uh, stormwater management plan. So we're looking at about $10 million that's going to cost us. So we've got that. We've got a school system that needs things. Everybody wants to promise that they're going to cut this, they're going to cut that. I want to stay fiscally responsible. I want to keep the county in the shape it is in. And if you don't think you're better off now than you were four years ago, I don't know what else we could do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you again for being here, for having us. Uh, I think we need to look at a reason why we uh, turn over our commissioners. I mean, because there's a lot of stuff that we still have big issues in the county. We've, and we've addressed, we've talked about them, traffic, development. And a lot of those are still here. And I would like to just say that as a commissioner for you, I would make sure that you knew that I had your back. While you're out doing your stuff, there's nothing going on behind your back that you're not aware of. And I think that's part of the, uh, the distrust that goes on. You know, our planning and zoning meetings should be in the evening. Why are they in the mornings when most of you can't attend? And that's when a lot of stuff happens because many things happen at planning and zoning that don't even go before the commissioners. So someone needs to be watching to make sure things are going the way the citizens want them to go. Uh, staff meetings, many people don't even know about staff meetings. Those are also in the morning. Uh, so I'm just for open and honest government. You should take priority. The citizens should be priorities over tourists, um, uh, the elected officials. We're supposed to be serving you and not the other way around. And so think about voting for Helen Bennett for Queen Anne's County Commissioner at large on June 26th. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Well, the, the League of Women Voters would like to truly um, express our appreciation for all the citizens and public coming out this evening. We had a, a good turnout. Um, and I'd like you to please join me in, in thanking our candidates.
right back to all of you.